Right. Hello. So we do record the uh, the sessions and then we put them up on our YouTube page the light for the library so you can find that by going to our website at the Alfred Box of Books library. All right. Yep, and you can find our a link to our YouTube page there and all of the old sessions are there too. <laughs> you can go back a whole year. Oh my god. That's we're up to session Everyone, 22. Yeah. This is 22. Usually usually they're up the same day, if not the next day. And then once right. in a while we forget to press the button. Yes. So there's nothing. <laughs> oh, well, it happens. Yeah. <laughs> You weren't the only one that did that, by the way. Did I, Ian do it? Ian did it once. Okay, yeah. Is Ian gone or is he still? He's here. here on okay. Sunday. All right. And Wednesday. All righty. Uh, Melanie's uh, for the last couple of months, the work study student was doing all the computer work. I'm totally ignorant of the computer work. So I jokingly said the last time, two weeks, what, a month ago? Ian has the fingers and I do the talking. So Melanie has taken over the um, the computer part, which is going to be pretty simple today. We only have one diagram to show. So if, if anybody else joins us, I don't know. Maybe they are all busy doing something else. They forgot about us. How many people do you normally have log in during these? Um, usually six to ten. We have, I think, a total of eleven altogether. And usually most people, unless they have an appointment or like once Sandy was down with her mother in Florida and couldn't hook up um, or Debbie and Steve were off on a vacation in New Mexico and I had wanted them to go see that beautiful, um, all those radio telescopes there, oh, but they didn't, say, they didn't get to do it. But I thought you were gonna say area 51. What's it? The array is that what it's called? No, <laughs> Area Fifty One, where the UFOs are. Oh, the UFOs! No, 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 no. <laughs> I went through there with Sue Bergen once, and it was kind of hysterically funny. Right. But you have to be very serious. Some people take it very seriously. Some people take it very seriously. Yes. Well, you can't take yourself. There's too enough seriously. porn every day. <laughs> We're online, aren't we? I should be yeah. good. I should be good. I'm a bit irreverent. Um, do you go by Chris? Yeah, Chris. Uh, okay. Somebody told me that you used to teach at the Czech. And that I used to teach at, at the Czech. At the Czech? The... Alfred State Tech or not? Oh, Tech. Yeah, Alfred State College I did, yeah. Okay. What'd you teach? Uh, digital electronics. Oh, wow. Well, I taught the art appreciation classes, which is probably why we never ran into each other. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Oh, well, they did stick yeah, us in I, the engineering building there at the end. Oh, well. Yeah, just in the engineering building. That's where I hung out. Okay. Okay. Well, why? I, I believe in starting on time. I don't know where everybody is. You scared them off, Chris. <laughs> I guess so. Okay. Um, I'm going to do, I'm going to start with a review of what to look for this month of December. And uh, Rima, if you're listening, this is for you, 4 a.m. in the morning. Rima is the other librarian and she and I tend to get up at around four in the morning from time to time. Um, that is when on the 14th of December, the Geminid meteor shower is going to peak. Um, and this particular year, the sun, the sun, right? The moon will have set around midnight. I think it's a quarter moon. So it should be gone from the sky by four in the morning. Meaning if the sky is clear, it'll be nice and dark. And we'll be able to see some meteors, shooting stars, where to look. Um, Chris, I don't know how much you know about astronomy. Um, do you know what the winter triangle is? Have you ever heard no, of that? No, I don't. Okay, are you familiar with any of the constellations like Orion? Yeah, I'm familiar with the names, but I couldn't recognize them. Okay, uh, Melanie, can you tell him how to find the star charts? Remember oh. that we print out? <laughs> yes. Okay. Um, I'll let Melanie tell you how to find the monthly star chart. So you can either just look at it on your screen or print it out. So how does he do that? So I will put a link to them on our website on the 
events calendar. I'll put a link to the star chart um, for December on our next event for the star talk. All right. And then we should do that every month because not every, um, I guess everybody but me has a computer and, and Regina doesn't have one either, does she? No, no she, 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 she comes here. Yeah. So do you have access to a printer or you have a computer, right? Yeah, yeah, I have a printer and a computer. Yeah. Okay, so you can print out a star chart. So I know what, can we find the winter constellations? Mm -hmm. We're gonna, Melanie's gonna find an image of the constellations and put it up on your screen. And then we can talk about where to look to see the shooting stars. All right. Do you want so, the star chart? Um, yeah, I want Orion and neighbor the winter winter constellations for us in the northern hemisphere, with Orion kind of in the middle. Hold up. Now, as an aside, isn't there a an app you can get on your phone where you can uh, yeah, this will be good <laughs> uh, see the sky the the stars just point your phone up to where you're looking and it will. Yeah. Display the star. yeah. Once again, I don't have a smartphone either, but Melanie can tell you how that works. Yeah, there are several different apps that you can use. I think the one I use is called Stellarium, but I know there are others. I like the one where you can just point it up, yep. even in the house, right? It yep. goes right through the roof. <laughs> Magic. Okay. Can okay. You can see? you see this, um, Chris, on your screen? Oh, yeah. Okay. Chris is got the PL. Yeah. Yeah. Let me see. Where's Orion? Mm. Okay, whoops. Orion Nebula. Okay, let's can we scoot this just over? Never mind, this is good enough. Um, in the middle of December at four in the morning, Chris, Orion and Taurus are going to be further to the west, over to the right. The meteors are going to look as if they were shooting from Pollux and Castor in Gemini, the twins. And they're going to be heading sort of at an angle so that they're coming down towards Aldebaran, the red star in Taurus, or Capella, a, a creamy ivory uh, pale yellow star high in the sky. But once again, they're all gonna be at four in the morning further to the west. So the winter triangle, hmm, is Rigel down in the knee of Orion, and Betelgeuse is reddish up there in his shoulder. And then we can't see, but over here, the third part of the triangle is the brightest star in the winter sky in the north, Sirius. They make up what is called the winter triangle. Rigel, Betelgeuse, Sirius. So when right. I said, if you find those three, you look up above and then the meteors should be shooting down in that direction. Now, which, which star is considered the North Star? That would be Polaris, which is right here. From there, the, all right. Pardon? All right, yeah, I got it. Okay. All right, so when we have a meteor shower, Usually it extends over a two to even three week period, but they have what they call the peak night. And for the Geminids, it would be December 14th. The chance of it being clear, eh, probably not so good, but maybe two days on either side of the 14th would be, you'd probably see, I don't know. Uh, you could look it up online, different showers at different time of the year have more meteors per minute than others. I'm online right now. Okay. All right. All right. The second date is our winter solstice. At exactly 1059 in the morning on December 21st. I 21st. Think it also, the 21st. It's not always the 21st, but give or take a day. So this year it's at 1059 in the morning on December 21st. And in a few minutes, we'll talk about what that means. The other date to look forward to 
is two things that happen on New Year's Eve, December 31st. And the first one, so once again, Rima, you and me, 5.30 a.m. in the morning. <laughs> if you get up early and it's clear on New Year's Eve, if you look to the east towards where the sun will be coming up in another hour and a half, so it's still dark, you will see rising to the southeast. First, closest to the horizon is Mars. And then a short distance away to the west, to the right, is Antares. And between them, and a little bit above, a thin, thin crescent old moon. So a beautiful sight. Um, way back last year when we st were studying the color of stars and planets, I had a question. What made Mars look reddish? And what made Antares look reddish? And the answer to that was, well, most of the soil and rocks on Mars have been oxidized, the iron in them. And it has, it's like rust, so it's reddish. But Antares is a, um, a super red giant, which may blow up any time in the next million or two million years. Who knows? It may happen tomorrow. We won't see it tomorrow because it'll take a while to reach us. But those are both reddish, one a planet, one a star. Then the other thing that evening at five o'clock, about an hour after the sun goes down, looking to the west, you'll see maybe four, but definitely three planets in a curve, starting first higher in the sky, Towards, more towards, um, towards the center of the sky, Jupiter, which is still pretty bright, then a fainter Saturn, and then a brilliant Venus. And then if it's really clear and not windy, and you don't have hills and trees in the way, you'll see Mercury just below Venus and a little bit to the left. So are you drawing a diagram? Kind of, yeah. <laughs> yeah, right. <There> you go. <laughs> um, we've talked in the past about the ecliptic, which I think of as the highway in the sky, that the sun travels with the stars in the background. And if you envision a line, a curved line connecting Jupiter to Saturn and sloping downward to bright Venus, that they're right on the ecliptic. So they mark for you like the center line and the super highway in the sky. So those are all events of the coming month. Now, let's see. Nobody else has tuned in. Where is everybody? My goodness. The, well, Chris, you have hit the worst attendance uh, record of all year. <laughs> I don't know where everybody oh. is. Yeah, usually we have at least six. I don't know where everybody is. Okay, so we'll, we'll, I will then talk about what I had assigned my grandson Jordan who lives in San Diego and I, I called him an hour ago but I don't know what he is doing he had to look up NEO capital letters which stands for a group of astronomers that are interested in near earth objects like the biggie from 65 million years ago six miles wide that's like from here to Alfred Station, at least, a little bigger than that. Bigger than that. Well, it wiped out not only the dinosaurs, but much of what else was alive on the earth back then. And sometime come the winter, if we can figure out how to do it, I gave a DVD about two years ago to the library called The Day the Mesozoic Died. And it was all about the Alvarez father and son back in the 70s and 80s who began to do research on, oh, we think this grand extinction of 65 million years ago was caused by this either comet or asteroid that hit us. And it took about 20 years to gather scientific proof. And now it is, I would say 95% accepted as, that's the reason we have no more dinosaurs anymore. And there's us instead. <laughs> so anyway, there is a group of astronomers that, uh, um, 
Congress, I think, um, gave the money to, and I think 20 years or so ago, and every five years they report on, are there any near earth asteroids or perhaps comets that might be big enough if they hit to do some serious damage? So that's what the NEO group is about. And the other group he had to look up was SETI, S-E-T-I. I think that's also capital letters, but I'm not sure. Search for extraterrestrial intelligence. And um, I think sometime in the winter when we're getting bored, we'll spend a whole session on, are there little green men out there <laughs> or anything? See, little see, I was right about Area 51 all along. Yeah. See? I've never Area. heard it called that. You, you're talking about out, out by Alamogordo, right? In New I'm Mexico? In New Mexico. Yeah. yeah. Area 51. Oh. Let's go. Okay. I think we need a road trip. A road trip. We need to take All this right. on the road. <laughs> well, listen, there's going to be an eclipse of the sun down in the Antarctic sometime this month if it hasn't already happened, but nobody wanted to go. So wow. anyway. All righty. Then the third thing Jordan was going to do, he's not going to get his box of Christmas cookies. He, he's... <laughs> He didn't do his homework. Um, two weeks ago, while we were in session here, NASA sent off a rocket towards the asteroid belt. And it's going to take until next September to get there. They're not really close by. Not like the moon or Mars. They're further away. Um, and the purpose was to see if, unlike Hollywood, we're not planning to blow it up. We're planning to nudge it slightly off course. That might mean only a tenth of a centimeter off course. Because obviously, if an asteroid once upon a time did what it did, it can happen, it will happen again. And so now we have maybe the technology to avert that disaster by knowing an incoming and being able to divert it so it doesn't hit the earth. So anyway, next September, we'll find out whether it was successful or not. Okay, topic for the day was the winter solstice. And so how I set this up, Chris, sometimes we do some reviewing, and then I have a topic and people chime in. Sometimes I ask questions. Sometimes people are embarrassed because they don't know the answer, but that's okay. We don't know, a lot of us don't know most much. Anyway, um, and then I assign questions for the next time. Some of this is a bit of a review. Um, when we first started in February, when spring came along in March, we talked about what the, I have to stop and think, the equinox was all about. And then in June, the summer solstice, and then in March, once again, the equinox was about. And so now we've come full circle and the winter solstice is coming up. So I wanted to review a few things so we can picture in our mind's eye what's going out there in three-dimensional space. Um, I think, Chris, are you aware that um, our axis, North Pole, South Pole is tipped at 23 and a half degrees? Yeah. Okay, sometimes when you talk geometry, people go blup, they go blank. So I try and visualize what this all means. And so I've come up with the old fashioned record player. And you have a spindle in the middle and you sit the record on the, um, the disc over the spindle. And then when you turn the record player on, it goes round and round. So if the spindle is the sun, and the earth is riding in its orbit on the rim of the record. You could say the whole record is the plane of the orbit. Okay. okay. Now, if our earth sat upright on the rim of the record, no tilt, straight up and down, we would have no seasons. It'd always be cold up at the North and South Pole. It'd always be hot in the tropics. <laughs> There'd be no winter, summer, spring, and fall. It's only because of the tilt. And all the planets do not tilt at the same amount. It's roughly anywhere from two degrees, which is hardly any tilt, which means that planet, and if I remember correctly, 
it's mercury but i'm not i can't be sure yeah. people always google when i don't know answers they google it up and hopefully google knows the answer um to uranus who's tipped all the way 88 degrees so it's rolling around its orbit on its side and has very extreme seasons but for us 23 and a half degrees now i knew this and had forgotten it and reviewing for this week i re read again that's not absolute, it doesn't stay that way forever. It varies between 22 and 25 degrees, hmm. which is only three degrees. And we're right in the middle of that right now at 23 and a half. But it's gonna change over something like a 26,000 year cycle. Long time. What were people doing 26,000 years ago? Um, we just arrived in Europe, the Homo sapiens, <laughs> a long time ago, began painting caves. Um, and it just so happens that for us, give or take 2,000 years, that North Pole points at that star you asked about, Polaris, which was great. We talked about navigation, why the people of the North seem to get ahead in the world more so than those of the South because of Polaris. Um, but in 8,000 years or so, due to that wobble, due to that shifting, it'll point to Vega, that bright summer star in Lyra. So nothing is the same forever. And we grow up in our 100 years lifetime. And we think what is, was, and will be forever. And that's not true. Um, so, all righty. Then we talked about where, what's the sun doing in different parts of the world at those four times of the year. So on December 21st, if you live down in Brazil, along what is called the Tropic of Capricorn, which is the line, the latitude that's 23 and a half degrees south of the equator at noontime, the moon would be the moon. The sun would be straight over your head, ninety degrees in the, at noontime. But for us, up here in the northern hemisphere, in New York, roughly forty degrees north, if it's clear, and we go out at noontime, when the sun is halfway between sunrise and sunset, and we where is it? Well, it's only twenty six and a half degrees above the southern horizon which if 90 is straight up and zero is straight out, that's only about, let's see, a quarter of the way above the Southern horizon. It's quite low in the Southern sky at noontime for us on that first day of winter. And anybody that's up by seven in the morning, it doesn't rise due east, but it's off to the southeast by 23 and a half degrees, that magical tilt again. And it sets over in the southwest at 23 and a half degrees from true west. And I, I always like to come up with something that I think nobody knows or thought about or connected. And many of the old farmhouses where people relied more on solar power in the natural world to be comfortable. The kitchen was always, almost always in the southeast room of the house because that's where the sun came in early in the day. And their living room or parlor would be in the southwest corner of the house mm. where the setting sun in the afternoon would shine in. Hmm. Yeah. Hmm. So anyway, yeah. um, when you're building your new house and you want to be you know, connected, Maximize the sunlight. Maximize the sunlight and the heat and the light. Yep. All righty. Um, and then before we move on, I have this crazy drawing that Melanie put up for me. I took a picture uh -huh. of it and put it on. Let's see. We're going back to medieval Europe. Just to find it. Magic. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> Okay. I have to go back to Zoom and say share. Alrighty. Press the right buttons. All right. Can you see that, Chris? Yeah. 
Yeah, already. This is from what, I, well, you know what? As a matter of fact, I was, I, I talked a little over 20 years at the tech and I always did a unit on architecture and I also did, well, different kinds of units, but um, my mother, at, who was a good Catholic, um, sent me this article from one of the, her Catholic newspapers about how the medieval cathedrals built in the 11 and 1200s in Europe could actually be used as clocks and calendars. Mm. And so what I did was a sketch. Um, originally, the Christian church in the early days, starting in Rome, was simply a rectangle with a curved end on one end. And it simply was a copy of the Roman Basilica, the law court. And there were no seats or anything, but everybody stood. And the three judges sat up in the front of the church, right? I mean, the Basilica, the law court. And as far as I know, they were not oriented towards any particular direction. But if you study sacred architecture, whether it be pagan, Christian, Muslim, or whatever, there's always a connection to the stars, mm -hmm. the sun, the moon. And um, so the Christian church started off just the basilica, just a rectangle, and usually a curved end. Later on, the side transits were established to give it a cruciform look, like a cross. But what they did was they aligned it. And by the 1100s, they were pretty good at, at being able to do that. If the Egyptians could do it 5,000 years ago, <laughs> the, uh, the, the Christians um, 4,000 4, years later could do it, right? So the doors, the three doors open to the west, whereas the altar was placed in the eastern side end and the rose window, the big, beautiful, round rose windows dedicated to Mary was over the altar. Now, anybody that I built my own house, I thought it was perfect. There's always a leak somewhere in the roof. <laughs> There's a crack somewhere that the water or the light can get in. And so in medieval times, I don't know which cathedral it was, who made the observation, was it, if it was a priest, a monk, um, a, a, someone who just went to the church, but at dawn, the light coming in from a hole in the roof, not from the window, but from a hole in the roof. Pause. Who knows what a pinhole camera is? You know? Do you know, Chris, a pinhole yeah. camera? Well, why don't we let Chris, what's a pinhole camera? How does it work? Uh, from what I recall, it's uh, made of uh, uh, a black box and just a, a pinhole to mm -hmm. let the light through. And then what and then, happens? The light that comes through the pinhole goes on to a, a, I guess you have a plate of film inside. Well, you don't have to. Um, you can't record it if you don't have a film. But the first one was in the 1500s and it was just a box. And, and the image shown on the, the side of the inside of the box opposite the pinhole. And it was upside down. All right. Um, yeah. Well, in a sense, the cathedrals were dark, fairly dark. Um, and this small hole in the roof allowed, it was like a pinhole. And what the image that came through was the round sun. So you would see on the floor, depending on the size of the hole and the height of the roof, I guess, um, a, a, a disc of light. Mm -hmm. And in the morning, it would be towards the west end. And then as the day progressed, it would move down the aisle towards the east end. And if the church was perfectly aligned east and west, then on our two equinoxes in September and March, it would move straight down the middle of the nave. Mm. But in summer, when the sun was higher in the sky, did I do that right? <laughs> Yes, this is this is south over on the right hand side. Then day by day, the disc would shift over towards this aisle on the north side and travel down it. And at the winter solstice, this is our experiment with mm -hmm. the wind. Um, 
the sun would be high, um, lower in the sky. And so it would be, um, hmm, I think I got them backwards, didn't I? Let me just think for a minute. Yep, I got them backwards. See, Chris, make mistakes. Just reverse these two, ba -doop -ba -doop, because in the summer, the sun is higher. And so it'll be, um, the sun will shine closer to the southern wall, right? Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so I made a mistake. So we switch them. Um, everybody had an assignment to do, and that was if they had a room that faced south with a window, starting on December 21st, going through March 21st, once a week at noontime, if it was clear, measure how far the sun went into your room. And it'd be the same thing, you know, as the cathedral, where depending on where it was, east and west, you could tell what time it was. It'd be like a, a sundial mm -hmm. clock. And as it shifted throughout the year back and forth from the center to the side aisles, you could, it's a calendar, you know, what month it is or what week it is. We use the pinhole camera for the eclipse. Did you? Yeah. Oh, the, okay. In 2017. Oh, that's right. I did it for the transit of, of Venus back in 98. Oh, yeah. Because yeah. then you get the image. Well, Chris, I tried to, I always gave my students different uh, uh, projects. And one of them was I tried to have somebody find a, uh, an abandoned refrigerator box that they would put a pinhole in, cut out a door, and then have it be able to be sealed up so it'd be dark inside. Mm -hmm. And then they were to put it out on the mall there on the campus, and go sit in it and um, watch everybody go, go by upside down. <laughs> <laughs> but nobody do, did it. <laughs> but it would have been a great experiment. All right, we can get rid of this. Uh, Got to change that. Okay, we should change it before we put it online. Or yeah, we just still have to figure it out. Okay. All righty. Um, next time we're going to talk about Christmas, what and why, and how it's connected to the heavens. But first, to finish up today, I wanted to talk about the pagan celebrations connected to the winter um, solstice. Who knows of any? Yes. Stonehenge oh. is connected somehow. Okay. Stonehenge is connected not just to the winter solstice, but to other, um, the, uh, the summer uh, uh, one. Right. And also, let me think. The equinoxes? Probably, yeah, and also the moon phases. They don't talk about okay. that as much. But okay. Yeah, Stonehenge was a, a many, many, many sided um, monument. What else? What about the pyramids? Because I know the pyramids. We've uh, talked about the pyramids sometimes. Um, Are they? I have to think. They were more connected with the to, alignment of that star. Right, which was the North Star back then. Thuban, I think. Yes. Which is in Draco, which yep. is near Polaris, but in 4,000 years, the earth, that axis has tilted. Yeah. But they were most, the, the point of the pyramid, the four sides, right, was paint pretty much straight north and south. Okay. But it had to do with um, the, the dead pharaoh becoming a god and allowing to, him to escape to join the sun. Mm. Mm. Rather than a celebration okay. of the equinoxes, I think. Okay. How about any, okay. Yep. Is there any uh, astronomical connection with the uh, the figurines on Easter Island? I have to think. Um, I did study them once. I don't believe so, but you're perfectly free to do some research and correct me or add to my ignorance next time. How's that? I don't believe so. There's still... I read Kantiki originally, Thor Heyerdahl's book way back when, 50 years or so ago. Um, and I'm sure they've learned a lot more since then. But I don't think it had to do with the equinoxes. All right. But look it up. They've, they've done a lot of research in 50 years. I know National Geographic had an article on it. I even cut that out maybe mm, 20 years or so ago. 
or the Pipos are part of this group and he and Anne have been there. So they might know something about them firsthand. Okay, the, especially, um, I think in general, two things in general. Previous to 10,000 years ago, when we turned to agriculture, we were all hunter gatherers. And in those days, the chief goddess tended to be the moon. And you can think back in our evolution, if you wanna keep track of time, obviously day, night, and then the moon, because it's roughly every month, every 29 days or so. It was only after a while that people began to use the sun, which was a little more complicated in understanding how it worked mm -hmm. as far as keeping time went. Um, once we turned to agriculture, though, most cultures developed a hierarchy of gods, the sun god being the most important, and the moon goddesses were kind of put to the side. And it seems to me the further north you lived, and I deal with the Northern Hemisphere almost all the time, because that's where the majority of the earth is and the peoples are. Think about it. Right now, a lot of people are moaning and groaning. It's dark when I get up. It's dark when I go to work. It's dark when I come home from work. <laughs> Um, but imagine living a primitive society where every day, the daylight got shorter and shorter and shorter, and it got colder, and your God was disappearing. It was really important to create ceremonies, give gifts, come back, don't keep going, you know, we need you. Mm -hmm. um, and so the further north you went, say in Europe, from the Mediterranean world, which was, they don't really have much of a winter and their day, daylight darkness is much more even. Mm -hmm. But as you got into Germany and then Scandinavia, um, it really got serious. And so bonfires at around the time of the winter solstice, which was the turning point, um, evergreens, evergreen trees don't seem to die. Mm -hmm. They seem eternal. So you hung your doorways with evergreens, branches. Um, another tradition in the German tribes, you would take gifts of fruit and grain and hang it in your oak trees that were special mm -hmm. for the Germans. Um, all as a way of thanking the sun god that we appreciate you we need you come back we want you to come back and lo and behold it worked mm -hmm. and i sometimes only half jokingly say if we start all buying artificial christmas trees we're in trouble that's what i'm gonna say all right i'm just keep moving on <laughs> so and we will be sorry so anyway, and then we have all those monuments. And sometime, once again, I promise, winter is filling up. We're going to run out of time. <laughs> I, know. Um, yeah. I taught a special two-week section on, what did I call it? Uh, the monuments to the ancient gods. And of course, it was all these places like Stonehenge. But there are hundreds and hundreds of places like that all around the world that are just some for the moon, some for the sun, some for um, the Pleiades or Venus. Venus is very complicated. The Mayans had a wonderful keeping track of what Venus was doing or where did she go? And they somebody finally figured out, oh, the morning star and the evening star are the same. Anyway, some other time. All right. Next time, it's all going to be about Christmas. How much time do we have left? Uh, about 15 minutes. 15, good. Because I have a long list of questions for the people who aren't here and chris we're going to give you chris gonna... chris basically you just have a lot of homework this time <laughs> get started with all. <laughs> okay um well let me think here who am i gonna um all right um 
I'm just trying to figure out. Well, Chris, I'm going to give you my grandson Jordan's assignment. Who are, and this maybe is, some of these are very much astronomy related and some aren't. Um, who are the Magi or the Three Kings? Where, oh. did, they come from? Where did they come from? Um, what were their jobs, <laughs> occupations? What were they looking for? Okay. All right. Okay. Well, according okay. to the song, they're from the Orient, right? <laughs> yes, but what's, okay, where's the Orient? We know where they came from and what they did. So you find out and let us know next time. Okay, Regina is looking up. She called me up before to say she had that luncheon this time and couldn't come. I've given her the assignment of what was the star of Bethlehem? There's a couple of theories out there as to what it was. We've studied both of them in the past. So she's going to track that down in 4 BC. What was the star of Bethlehem? And then, um, who's this? Mary Lou Cartledge and her husband, Jerry. I'm going to give them this controversial question of, when was Jesus born? What was the date of his birthday? I got, by the way, Chris, I got into a huge argument with a, a fellow who was from the Christian right in my class once. I was right and he was wrong. <laughs> he had to admit it finally after he did some more research as to when was Jesus born? Not okay. in December. Not in December, no. <laughs> Alrighty, and then um, Debbie Jacoby is gonna find out um, when we celebrate Christmas, when we, when we came up with the 25th of December, when was that and where was that? Who decided on that? And it was not when baby Jesus was a baby. So, okay. And then um, Bob Pipel, who was a chemistry professor, retired now at the university, he's going to come up with why did the church decide on the 25th of December? And his wife is going to research the tradition of the Christmas tree. Where did that come from? Did it have any connection to the winter solstice? Rima, the other librarian here, is going to look up St. Nicholas. Who was that? Or Chris Kringle or Santa Claus? Are they all the same guys? Different names, different countries? Were they real? When did they live? Sandy, who lives in Albany, but has a, a cabin here and just visited this last week. Um, she's going to look up. She doesn't know this yet. I have to call her. Um, is there anything on the Jewish calendar, she's being, she's being Jewish, um, that's connected to the winter solstice? Now they just went through Hanukkah, but I don't believe that had anything to do with the solstice. It had to do with a military victory and a miracle. And finally, Melanie <laughs> has to figure out where the reindeer come from because Europe and the Mediterranean, uh, um, we don't have reindeer. So what's going on with St. Nicholas and his reindeer? And his reindeer. Why isn't he using horses or oxen or something? And why are they flying? Or real animals that fly. <laughs> right, or real animals that fly. Yeah, and why do the reindeer fly? There really is something to that. So okay. you, um, and I would suggest you look up the Sami, the Lap Laplanders. So that's my questions for next time. Chris, do you have any questions? Yeah, uh, one thing I've always kind of wondered is during the winter months, the sun is low in the sky. Uh -huh. And is that the sole reason why it's so cold? Because we're not getting a direct hit from the sunlight? Or is okay. it the shorter days that make it cold? All right, do you have a flashlight handy? No, not handy. Okay, you, I can, can you can visualize it. All right, flat tabletop, flashlight. If you hold it over 90 degrees at a straight angle up and down, all the light and the heat is in a concentrated circle, right? That's, yeah. the, that's the equator. The sun is more often directly overhead in the area of the equator 
than anywhere else in the world. And so the heat and the light that it gives off is more concentrated there. And therefore, that's one reason why it's warmer there. You take that flashlight and tip it at an angle. Your same amount of light and heat is spread out into an ellipse now. And you can actually see if it's a dark table and a dark room, the light is not as concentrated. It's spread out over a greater area. So the, the earth is not flat and the sun isn't tilted, but the earth is curved and that is the same um, result in that the angle of the sunlight hits the earth such that at the poles, it's much more spread out. So if you stand outside for an hour with short sleeves or nothing in the node at the tropic, you know, in the tropics around the equator, you're going to get sunburned and it's hot. You could stand out for an hour and if you didn't freeze at the North Pole, you would not be nearly as warm because there's not as much concentrated energy. So that's part of the answer, the angle of the sun. And the other is the length of the day. The longer you have your heat heater running in your house, the um, warmer your house is going to be. So for us in the summertime, we have, let me think, um, I think 15 hours of sunlight. But in the winter, we only have nine. So those are the two main reasons why. What was your question? <laughs> <laughs> why it's cold yeah yeah why it's cold and why it's warm those are the two basic reasons all right now yeah, there's also once you get into the atmosphere and the ocean and currents of fluids that transfer heat that that's something else that adds to the complication of the answer all right all right good <laughs> All right, so I will research the three kings. Yeah. <laughs> All right. No, seriously. They were serious men who had serious jobs in a certain empire of the time. To the east, you're right. The, or the Orient was in the east. <sighs> I think it's China and the Islamic maps place east to the top of the page, unlike us place north to the top everything is relative all right yeah well that <laughs> makes sense i understand that in texas a, a map of the united states shows texas much bigger than it really is of course well that's <laughs> like that famous new yorker poster from i don't know when the 70s they showed new york the map of the u.s and it was almost all New York City. And then towards the top of the page, there was the Hudson River. And then everything else was crammed into the top quarter of the, of the US. There, I, I actually taught also a unit on map making, the art of map making. And um, there were all sorts of incredible maps. The, one was from Australia, where they put Australia in the center of the world, <laughs> of the map. And everything else was kind of on the periphery. you know. And there was Australia right in the middle. Um, and then the um, one way of doing a map of the US is by population rather than size. So the states that are most dense in people like California, New York, Texas would be much larger in the scheme of things than Wyoming or North Dakota who don't have many people. So They're all constructs of the mind. You know, maps are just symbols, ideas that we put down on paper using images to convey ideas. What did you teach again? What kind of engineering? Uh, electronics. Electronics. You missed, was it last week, we talked about the uh, electromagnetic uh, spectrum and how we use Originally, it was just our eyes. For thousands of years, we looked up into the sky at night and what we could see, visible light, was what we could know. But then starting a little over hundred years ago, we began to use radio waves. And now we have special telescopes that just do that. And they can teach us all sorts of things that our sight cannot. 
And then we went through the spectrum. And I think your friend Roger was supposed, if he had tuned in, was supposed to look up quasars. How do we study quasars? What do they emit in that from um, radio waves to gamma rays? What do we pick up to study them? So if you see, do you see Roger from time to time? I talk to him on the phone. On the phone, okay. Well, if he wants to join in, he's more than welcome. Yeah, all right. Okay. Good. Well, next time, next week, hopefully there's gonna be a few more people. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, Tom, that you're, you, you, you're not scary. Um, you, you're <laughs> just a regular guy that wants to know something about astronomy. And well, this is unusual. Usually there's yeah. at least six people. Yeah. But sometimes people have doctor's appointments or they're working or something comes up and they can't make it. So um, I hope so too. Yeah. Otherwise we'll just recede into the we'll die. far end of the universe and they'll lose <laughs> sight of us and we'll, we'll end our program. We'll extinguish like a yeah. dying star. By the way, last thought, of all the various cultures that I'm aware of, the only one that ends grimly, most religions, most cultures have a positive end to life, whether it's heaven or whatever. Not the Norse people from Scandinavia. Their mythology, the battle between light and dark, cold and warmth, what we would call the bad guys, the cold and the dark wins out. And in the end, it all comes to naught. Everything just grinds to a halt and you freeze. Mm -hmm. mm. Which of course is one of the theories of the end of the universe, which I think is interesting. And we'll study that too, one of these days when we want to get gloomy about how it's all gonna end. Okay. Cheerful. I'm cheerful, aren't I? Yeah. But it's so far away, you don't have to worry about it. <clears throat> okay, see you in two weeks. Thanks for joining us, Chris. Sure. I think it's the 21st, right? It's just before Christmas, a few days. Today yes. is the 7th? Today is the 7th. All right. So we want reports on if anybody saw any of those meteor showers or got up early and saw the moons, etc. Oh. All right. Okay. Bye. All right. Bye. Bye.